Welcome everyone. My name is Harmony Barker. I am the Public Programs Manager at Holocaust Museum LA, the first and oldest Holocaust Museum in the United States founded by survivors. We were founded in 1961 by survivors who wanted to create a safe place to display their precious artifacts, to remember their family members and loved ones who had perished, and to educate future generations on the important lessons of the Holocaust. Today, the museum continues to provide free Holocaust education to students from across Los Angeles, the United States, and the world, fulfilling the mission of our founders to commemorate, educate, and inspire. Thank you for joining us for today's program, The Lost Train, Survivor Twins Remember. Born in Amsterdam in 1938, twins Marion and Stephen were just five years old when they were arrested along with their parents and eventually deported to Bergen-Belsen concentration camp. In April of 1945, as Allied forces approached, the Nazis loaded the Hess family onto what became known as the Lost Train. Initially bound for another camp, the transport repeatedly encountered bombed out tracks and meandered for two weeks before it was ultimately liberated by Soviet troops. Marion Ein Lewin and Stephen Hess are with us here today and will share their family's remarkable story of survival and the little known history of the lost train. We are so pleased to have Marion and Stephen here with us to share their story. Uh, before we get started, I just want to let everyone know that there will be an opportunity to ask questions at the end of the program. If you have a question, you may uh, address it to our speakers by typing it in the Q&A box at the bottom right-hand corner of your Zoom window. Uh, it is now my pleasure to introduce Marion I. Moon and Stephen Hess. Thank you, Harmony. Uh, and thank you, audience, for, for joining us tonight. Uh, time is short. Uh, it's, it, it's nearly impossible uh, to uh, condense five years of Nazi occupation and two, year, two years of concentration camp in, uh, in the time allotted. Uh, so what we decided is to just tell you a, a interesting, tragic, uh, and not too well-known uh, single incident uh, that, that occurred uh, at the very end of the war, about two weeks before the defeat of Nazi Germany. Uh, Marion and I uh, are Dutch twins. We are, uh, as far as the archivist at Bergen-Belsen informs me, uh, the only still living twins uh, of Bergen-Belsen who, who have still survived. Uh, survival was, uh, was tenuous all around, uh, but for children, uh, especially so, and for twins, ne uh, nearly uh, unheard of. Uh, let me just, excuse me, just going to, Bergen-Belsen was a huge camp. Uh, we were first, we, we were arrested uh, in, in 1943 and first sent to a place called Westerborg, uh, which was a marshalling center, a collection center in the Northeast of Holland from which uh, it, it was in Holland, but it was taken over by the Nazis. And from, from there, approximately 107,000 Jews from Holland, not all Dutch, uh, quite a few refugees, but about 100, 7,000 Jews from Holland were sent there over a period of about three years uh, to four destinations. These destinations, uh, three of them, uh, two of them were death camps, Auschwitz and Sobibor. Uh, one was, well, they were all death camps. Uh, one was Theresienstadt, which was supposed to be a model camp, but they, they exported their prisoners to Auschwitz, Auschwitz and were murdered there. And the last one, uh, was uh, back in Belsen, which was in Germany, about which very little was known uh, of, of, of the roughly 100 trains that left Westerberg uh, to the camps, only about uh, seven or eight trains actually went to Bag and Belsen. Uh, Bag and Belsen was a, a slave labor camp. It was not uh, a death camp in this uh, because strictly speaking by definition, a death camp was a camp that had gas chambers. Uh, and for, it's, uh, just for one example, 
uh, 35,000 Jews, uh, 34,000 who were shipped from Westerborg to Sobibor. At the end of the war, there were only 19 alive. Uh, Bergen-Belsen was unknown. Uh, it did not have gas chambers, so uh, it was the only place uh, where Jews could survive, and it was the only place that Marion and I and our parents could possibly have survived. The camp was workable uh, in a sense. I mean, it was a present starvation disease, but what happened was near the end of the war uh, in late 1944, the Soviets and the Allies were approaching uh, Nazi Germany. It was near, near the end, near defeat, uh, and the Nazis wanted to move uh, the prisoners, especially from Auschwitz and from the Polish camps uh, inward towards Germany to hide what they had done, which of course was impossible. But the result of this was that thousands and upon thousands uh, of Jews, including Anne Frank and her sister Margot, uh, were shipped to Bergen-Belsen. Uh, at that time, uh, and this was in October, started in October of 1944, by that time, uh, Bergen-Belsen became essentially unsurvivable from deaths of, of, of possibly a few hundred a month in the beginning, uh, in January to April, 35,000 Jews, mostly Jews, there were a few others, uh, most of Jews died uh, principally from starvation, disease, exposure, and murder. Uh, but in March, uh, the camp became really unsurvival, uh, and 18,000 Jews died in that camp alone. With those conditions, there was no, no, there was no longer food, there was no longer water, there was one tap that may work at times or, or did not work, but because uh, the, uh, the camp was just riddled with, with typhus uh, and, and people dying uh, by the thousands uh, every week, the Nazis uh, planned to evacuate what was called the exchange camp, which was the camp that Marion and I were in. The exchange camp was a, was a collection of four separate compounds that housed uh, they were called exchange Jews or Austausch Juden. Some people call them uh, privileged Jews or, or prominent, but these were Jews who held passports, legitimate or not, uh, citizenship, legitimate or not, uh, contacts overseas, uh, con important contacts in, in neutral countries. So the, these, these prisoners, including our family, uh, were kept in this exchange camp uh, to be used for exchange uh, for for goods for diplomatic advantage, uh, and these these were the four camps. The star camp, known as the Sternlager, was the camp Marion and I and our parents were in. Uh, it, it held mostly Jews from Holland, but a smattering of Jews from Spain and Greece and other places. There was the neutrals camp, which held prisoners from neutral countries such as Portugal and Spain. There was the Hungarian camp. Uh, these people were still in fairly good shape uh, and they, they, was, they were seen as possibly to be exchangeable uh, for, uh, for materiel. Uh, also the allies uh, had uh, thousands of German citizens interred uh, in, in uh, the way that we had interred uh, Japanese, uh, American Japanese in, in California during World War II. Uh, so the, uh, and the other thing was that the Nazis kept shipping the dying diseased Jews from Auschwitz into Bergen-Belsen. So in order to make room for these dying, well, we, we were all dying, but, but the, the, the ones from Auschwitz on the death marches uh, were nearly mostly beyond health. But in order to make room for them, uh, and in order to, to hide what they had done, uh, they decided to take the exchange prisoners, again, including our family, uh, on, uh, to Theresienstadt. Uh, so it, the, these were the four compounds, the neutrals camp, again, from neutral countries like Portugal and Spain, Hungarians camp from Hungary, and the special camp uh, also for people who uh, held some citizenship from co foreign countries uh, or from South, 
South America. Uh, this was a, a, as as much uh, as in the Holocaust. This was uh, measures they were they were they were done and on in in a short time without any planning. It was just decided, and so between April eighth and, and April tenth, about six thousand seven hundred Jews from the from the four compounds. And by the way, nobody, including the the archivists in Europe. Uh, know the exact number. But clearly, it, it was not 6,700. It could have been 6,701 or 7,000 or 6,500. Nobody will ever know. For example, uh, when we had to walk to the train, which was six kilometers, uh, 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 four people died just walking to, to the train. So the first train left on April 8th uh, and was liberated a short time later at Forsleben by Americans. The second train left the next day on April 9th and actually got to to Regenstadt with 1,700 uh, Hungarians. And the third train was our train, the lost train, which left near midnight, April 10th and 11th, uh, and meandered through Germany from uh, from that time, from the 11th uh, to uh, April 23rd, at which point uh, we were liberated by the Soviet troops near a very small a uh, farm village of a few hundred people, and it was mostly abandoned uh, in the village of, of Turbis. Just days later, after this all happened, uh, Lipberg and Belsen, in the meantime, uh, had been liberated. The British found 10,000 naked, unburied corpses. Uh, an additional 13,000 more Jews uh, died uh, after the camp was liberated by the British. Uh, mostly from typhus and starvation, they were they were uh, too sick and too far gone to save. Uh, in total, about fifty thousand, mostly Jews, died in Bergen-Belsen. The lost train uh, was the, one of the three trains uh, at the railroad station near Bergen. Uh, the train that we were on uh, consisted of forty-nine cattle cars and three very very old, dirty coaches. And the average capacity or the average loading was 52 persons per car uh, of uh, about 2,500 people. 85% uh, of them uh, were near death from typhus, dys dysentery that everybody had, salvation uh, and exhaustion. Uh, this train meandered. It stopped constantly, and I'll, I'll, I'll quickly touch on that. It was finally blocked at a destroyed bridge uh, uh, and pulled back into the farm village of uh, Turbis. This was the path of the lost train. Over here was Berg and Belsen, the ramp. Again, this is the third train. The other trains are shown uh, where they went. The destination was Turbis over here, uh, which was liberated uh, in late, uh, excuse me. Uh, the, the destination was uh, in, in, this, in this area right over, over here. Uh, and the lost train meandered through the countryside. It stopped nearly every day for various reasons. Uh, we were under air attack on several times. Uh, there was no food, uh, and there were about 70, 70 German guards, and they had to eat too. Uh, there was no water, so the train had to stop in order to fill up a bucket uh, with water, uh, and there were no sanitary facilities. These, these cars where the floors were totally covered by human waste. Uh, so uh, the, for one reason or the other, the, the trains, either the tracks were destroyed, but the train stopped often. These black boxes show all the places where the, where the Jews who died on the train, about 133 on the train, and many, many, many more afterwards. If the train stopped for a short time, the bodies were simply carried out and left at the tracks. If the train stopped for hours or sometimes a day, uh, the, the still surviving Jews tried to have a burial of, of multiple Jews in the train. Uh, and again, one train actually uh, reached raisin shot over here. So this was the this was the 13 day passage of the lost train ending in the village of Trebitz, uh not too far. And over all these hatched lines, where the allies, mostly the Soviets over here, the Western allies over here. 
this was the typical train. Uh, let me just, I'm covering up the, uh, between the, the 133 Jews who died on the train, uh, well, afterwards, another 435 died uh, after the, we were liberated by the Soviets. Uh, several died, couldn't even get off the train. Uh, the, each car was full of bodies uh, and they were left there. Eventually they, they were taken the, to Turbitz and buried. Uh, several died just, just walking to the village. Uh, but in total, about 568 people died uh, on the lost train out of a total of approximately 2,500. Marion, I will turn it over to you and I'm gonna stop sharing. Okay, well, thank you, dear brother for- uh, we're, uh, we're only 350 miles away, but go ahead. Uh, for an interesting history of really a chapter um, that is so interesting and intriguing and that people don't know very much about um, the story of the lost train. Um, you know, my memories of the lost train are actually a little bit vague, although three memories, three or four memories are very sharp in my mind. Um, the general memory is as my brother described was, um, you know, by this time, and of course we were still children, um, I don't think that people had much spirit um, or, or even a will to live. You were just someone who tried very hard to survive another day, another night, um, and, and all you could do is find an inch of the floor of a train to try to sleep. Um, and a morsel of food to eat. Uh, but, you know, there was really no tomorrow and yesterday. I think everyone at that point just focused on staying alive uh, another day. And, and also there was a question of what they were staying alive for because this was the lost train. Nobody had any idea where it would eventually end up. Uh, people knew it was the end of the war. People knew that one reason the train uh, moved so slowly was just to, because so many of the tracks were destroyed by bombing um, that the Germans wanted to get their soldiers out of the East. Um, and so, and there was only one track in many areas. Um, so the train was halted uh, frequently. And also, as my brother said, um, you know, there, there was nothing to eat. Uh, there were no bathroom facilities. So it was of necessity as well. I do have um, some sharp memories that I'd like to share with you. One was, and perhaps the most profound memory was that it was the first time that I saw someone actually buried in the ground because until then, we, we learned to count on, on seeing corpses in front of our barrack. Um, you know, they were as common as people see stones in front of their house or even grass. But here someone was taken off the train and actually buried, which to me was, was fascinating and memorable. And it was the first time I heard Kaddish, the prayer for the dead. And it was also the first time that I heard Hatikva. Of course, I didn't know what Hatikva was, but the music of the song was very beautiful and very haunting. And I, I must say that whenever I hear that um, song, that hymn, um, that um, Ode to Israel, I think of that. My second memory was that we resorted to eating, at least I did, and I think my brother as well, leaves from the trees. There were some trees, and one day I'll find out exactly the tree, where the leaves were very sweet and actually very edible. And then we even sucked off the bark um, of the tree and found that rather good as well. And so it just goes to show 
to what level we had um, been degraded and what we did just to nourish ourselves. Marion, you, want, you wanted us to describe mom's kitchen and how we got water from the locomotive when, yeah, when well, it was cooking time. Story. Well, Steve, I mean, you, you saw that story well. So why don't you, why don't well, you tell that story and then I'll tell my another okay. story. Uh, another side thing, the weather was beautiful. It was spring and the weather alone prevented uh, probably a hundred additional deaths. Uh, it was warm, it was beautiful. The skies were very clear, but the nights were very cold. And, and the worst thing was that uh, everybody had dysentery and the trains were locked at night, not during the day. Uh, and if you had to go, you had no choice. My father uh, wrote in his memoir uh, of one just one incident, I'm sure it happened repeatedly, of a man defecating into his food bowl in the middle of the night and trying to find a place in the corner of the train to empty it and stepping people, stepping over, uh, over the people in the car. Uh, but uh, uh, the, the Germans were responsible for getting food and they actually made an effort because it was the end of the war and they just wanted to go home to mama and the kids and they, uh, they, they'd had enough too. So they were, they were not the SS, there were a few SS on board. Uh, but they, they were mostly common soldiers. Uh, so uh, when the train stopped, my father, who had been terribly beaten, would clamber, clamber down. They opened the train so people could relieve themselves or, or, or fill, up a, fill up a bowl uh, at a stream. Uh, my father would clamber out and, and, and crawl into the farmland and come back with a potato or a couple of potatoes and bring them back and my mother had two two bricks that she would, uh, and, and, the, and these cattle cars were high. It wasn't, it wasn't like a coach. It was very difficult to get off, but you know, if you, you, you do what you have to do. My mother would set up, set up her two bricks and, and I can still visualize her with her face on the ground, blowing the twigs to start a fire. And at times Marion and I would, would walk up. We were, in, we were in train number six, box, box car number six we would walk up to the front of the train where the steam, the condensate was coming out of the pistons and we would hold out our, our dented cups to get some water and then walk back to where my mother was uh, trying to cook and she would cook grass or whatever she had until the Germans yelled, Aufsteigen, Aufsteigen. And then it, my mother had these, her stove, these hot bricks, which she would then quickly grab with a cloth and, and throw them into the train. They were, they were invaluable uh, so to put her stove back in the train. <clears throat> Up, go ahead, Marion. No, oh, Stephen, um, you should also tell the story when we lost our father, which was, my mother said that was the worst day for her in all the war, which is quite saying something. Um, when my father came out to forage for food, um, and he came back and the train was gone. Um, the train started up and we moved forward um, without our father after everything we had endured. So pick it up from there, Steve. Yeah, that was actually in Berlin. Uh, our well, father, yeah, uh, uh, Berlin, of course. Uh, our parents were, were heroic. And my father who was in very bad shape. I mean, everybody was, but he, he had been severely beaten, hardly walk anyway. But our parents were German and, and Berlin was a shell. The, the, the Germans didn't look so good either. And my father went to a Red Cross station and got some food and this, this took time. And he, he was blonde and blue eyed. I mean, he looked like, a, like the Germans. Uh, and he, all this took time. He came back and the train was gone. As Marion said, this was the, the uh, my mother, after all these years, what is it, uh, 75 years, it still gets to me. Uh, my mother uh, said later on, in, when she was much, when we were old enough to understand all these things, it was a single uh, worst day in, in her life. And my father uh, had no choice and he, and he went back uh, to the station uh, and, uh, the, hung the Hungarian train, the second train, happened to have been there. They were running parallel towards Theresienstadt, 
So my father, having no options, got on the Hungarian train and and just uh, this was actually just before Berlin, Marion, you're correct. Uh, and, and by pure, if you believe in miracles, this is it. Uh, the train got to Berlin uh, and the Hungarian train pulled up next to the lost transport. And, uh, and my, my father uh, saw my mother waving uh, at him uh, and uh, the train, it, both trains were stopped. And my father with about th three others who also missed the train, so to speak, got off the train and transferred back onto the lost transport. I mean, if, again, if you believe in miracles, that's it. Go ahead, Zeus. Well, another um, strong memory was when the train finally stopped um, and everyone was, you know, in a, in a daze, in a stupor. Why did it stop? Has it really stopped? Who stopped it? And now what is, what is the next step in our fate? Um, but the first thing that happened, that was my, my father, who was always a leader of sorts, he got off the train because the train was stopped by the Soviet army. And he got off the train because he wanted to speak to one of these soldiers uh, to find out something about what was going to happen to us next. And um, my father tells the story that they're talking and they discover that they're both Jewish. Um, you know, something about are you a Yid and, um, and, and the soldiers nodding, um, which, which was quite extraordinary. Um, so then we all got off this train and it was like an abandoned farming town and everyone just rushed to grab one of the little houses, um, farmhouses or wherever that most people had just escaped from. The people that were in that town, I guess they saw the Russians coming and had fled. So most of this little village, uh, the houses in it uh, were empty and we ended up in a little house, which I think my brother can even describe better than I. But the first thing that my mother wanted to do was to wash us. I mean, we had not had anything like a, a shower or a bath. In a year uh, and a half. For a year and a half. And, but I do remember the washing, but then she urged us to go to sleep. And the beds had sheets that were white. Uh, as snow as white sheets are, and the cover as white as snow. And of course, Germans were always good housekeepers. And um, I know that I refused to get into the bed because I had never seen anything that white and that clean. And it looked very, very scary to me. Um, I guess I finally, I finally did go to sleep, but, but that was certainly another memory. And then as my brother said, it was a very beautiful time of the year. And in this, um, in Turbots where we were liberated, it was the height of springtime. And I had never seen so many flowers and things in bloom. Um, they were like miracles to me. I had never seen these things. Um, and I must say from that day on, there's never a day when I don't have fresh flowers in the house because I equate it with, with um, blessings and being alive. And all of a sudden there was quite a bit of food because there were still farmers in the outskirts. So you could barter a chicken or steal a chicken. But I remember going out with my father very early in the morning, he had somehow gotten a bicycle and you know we would pick up vegetables and we would pick up eggs and we would pick up milk um, to me, that was so extraordinary. It was kind of entering a new life, entering a new world. Um, I remember those early days so vividly, which is not to say that there was not a lot of sadness in Turbots because so many people died there. They ate too much. Um, they died of typhus. There was a huge typhus hospital. Um, and, you know, that was especially poignant because after having survived Belsen, 
uh, this at the end of the journey meant to lose a mother and a father or a husband or a wife was, was especially tragic. Steve. Yeah, well, when the first, the first day, I remember vividly, we were both standing in the farmhouse and the first thing mom did, we had not washed in a year and a half. Uh, mom would, would take some rainwater and try to wipe us down, but that was useless. And uh, we had no toothbrush. And, and of course there were, there were no, no toilets. We, we had no idea what toilet paper was. You know, we, we acted like dogs, but dogs are made for that and human beings are not. Uh, but I vividly remember my mother uh, would take rainwater or any water and brush our teeth with like this with her finger. Uh, so we had we, we didn't even know what a toothbrush was. Uh, so Mary and I were standing in a laundry tub and my mother was, we, had, we hadn't seen warm water for a year and a half uh, and was heating water over, over this country stove. And we finally got scrubbed and then, then my parents uh, tried to wash a year and a half worth of filth off their own bodies. And I really remember when you, when you, when you and dad went foraging for food, there was no money and no credit cards and nothing, you stole it. That, uh, that, that, that was the currency of the day. You simply stole it. Uh, after Bag and Belson of the camps, uh, nobody had any compunction about small things like stealing food. Uh, unfortunately, there were people who, st who stole food from their own children in Bag and Belson. Uh, but I remember that, that, that dad would nail a chicken upside down with a nail to the feet uh, on the barn door to drain it. And we, have, we hadn't had any, you know, the only thing we had to eat in bergen Belson was turnips called kohlrabi. Uh, they, 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 they made some slop of, of fake coffee, but I don't remember that we, that we did anything with it. Uh, I believe we washed with it. Uh, and and uh, about an inch of what it was called ersatz of phony bread in which they mixed sawdust uh, to 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 save on 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 flour and and wheat, uh, we were in turbots uh, about nine, eight eight weeks, uh, and it, it 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 was quite, really quite amazing that the weather was so beautiful. Not it, it's it, it saved m many lives. Uh, and then one day, uh, I was fascinated by this. Marion less so. There was this long line of American trucks with GIs. American soldiers uh, and uh, lined in the middle of the street to take us away. And just the last story, and then I'll, then, then I'll stop and Marianne, let Marion finish. The, uh, there's, I guess there's humor in everything. Uh, the American soldiers all had collar buttons uh, with US on it, US, United States. Uh, but uh, the American GIs who were so different from the Russians you know, the, the Russians wanted to just kill Germans and the GIs wanted to go home for Christmas, but totally different, at, different attitude to his life and the enemy. Uh, but, the, but the GIs typically had two or three watches offered on both wrists, just at watches. So the, so the, 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 uh, the survivors of the families, mo most people spoke some German, uh, referred to the GIs US as Uhrensumblers, US watch collectors. So whenever I see the collar button US, I still remember the word watch collectors. And Marianne, you want to tell us about the, the trip to Leipzig and then to Holland? And then we're, I think then- Well, I, I want to talk a little bit. I know what, I think we should well, how, leave room how, how for, uh, for questions. Um, um, I think we should talk a little bit. Um, well, my memory, see, so we were in Leipzig kind of, it was, we spent one or two or three days um, moving back to Amsterdam. And I remember we were housed and it looked like a monastery or, or kind of was a red building. It was a monastery. Uh, it was a monastery, it was, yeah. yeah. But they had beautiful cherry trees. And of course I'd never seen cherries. And so somehow I had the courage to have someone hold me up so I could pick some of the low lying fruits, um, but I guess even as a little girl under these circumstances, um, I was always worried about 
the clothes on my back, probably for good reason, because I didn't have anything else hanging in my closet. Um, so I had a bowl of these beautiful cherries, but once I got on the ground to move from the cherry trees back to where we were uh, staying for an overnight, my shoes uh, were just covered with mud. It was, you know, it was a little thing, shoes being hopelessly covered in mud, but I think it was already, um, you know, after the war until I was about 10 years old, I never went to sleep without putting food at the bottom of my bed, um, even though I was living in America, the land of plenty. Um, but, you know, it was also the sense that you couldn't lose anything. If you lost shoes, you would never get another pair. So I remember I so overreacted to uh, my shoes being ruined in the search of beautiful cherries. Uh, Stephen, before we open it up to questions, I think we just talk about there was a reunion of the lost train. Yeah, I, I just want to add one thing to your cher the cherry tree. Uh, the day after we arrived at the monastery, the, the men, uh, the, the German Jews, the, the, the Dutch were, were more than willing to uh, accept their own Jewish citizens back. They weren't enthused about it. Anti-Semitism was always an issue, but they did not want the German refugees like my parents back in Holland. Uh, so the German Jews, quite a few of them were, were put into a, a Dutch concentration camp with Dutch collaborators and Dutch and, and, and captive Nazis. Uh, and of course, my father was always, you know, uh, quick to speak up uh, and to do what was right, uh, complain bitterly. Uh, interesting, I just, uh, I just uh, there's a book here called Return, uh, which a Dutch professor, a friend of mine, wrote about the return uh, to Holland. Uh, and the Dutch did not want the, the German Jews back. So we were, the, the men were put into a concentration camp for about 10 days. And it wasn't until they were able to contact uh, what was left of the Dutch gov government who rele re released my father uh, and, the, and the other German Jews. Uh, and then we were together again, but it was, as my father wrote in his memoirs, it was an extremely uh, bitter homecoming. Uh, we finally did get, uh, did get back to Holland. Uh, my father was then asked to be a witness at the one of the Nuremberg trials at the they're called the Belsen trials. And he went back to Germany for about a week to be a witness uh, against the capo. As a matter of fact, uh, uh, I just, I just, I thought I saw it. Oops, stay right there. Uh, I, I have a, a weird thing for what I collect. This is a, a, a it's by backwards. It's a death warrant uh, of the, of the of the capo, the the prisoner overseer who my father testified against, who was hanged on 11 October 1946. So I, I have his death warrant on the wall. You know, never never forget. I think uh, Harmony is Harmony back on. Marion, if you want to. Well, I just want to. Uh, there's, Harmony. There's, there's, there's not an ending to these stories, but. Um, for the 50th anniversary or commemoration, one should say, of the um, liberation um, of the lost train, um, there was a reunion of people who were still alive uh, who were on this train. And, and that was very emotional because so many of these people went on this particular commemoration because their father had died, their husband had died, their wife had died, and they could only leave it on the side of the train tracks. So um, this was a way of, of, of taking that route again, but and stopping at all the places where we had stopped, but paying homage uh, to people um, who died uh, on the lost train during those um, 13 days. Um, and then we also all visited Turbits, um, which of course had changed uh, in those 50 years, but there was a cemetery of people who had 
been in the camps and died of turbots, which was actually beautifully kept uh, by, by people in turbots. So it was a way of, um, of kind of closing the circle, although you really can't ever close those circles. Um, but that was also an interesting memory. So I guess we should open it up to questions. Yes, Harmony? Okay. Yes, uh, so we will now open uh, this up to questions from the audience. As a reminder to our audience, you can click on the Q&A box at the bottom of your Zoom window and type your question there. Um, while we're waiting for some questions to come in, uh, I just wanna say thank you to you both for, for sharing. Um, and uh, if you could uh, maybe answer a couple of my questions while we're waiting for some questions to roll in. Uh, first, uh, how old were you when you were liberated? Seven. You were seven. So you were both still fairly young, uh, you know. A lot how younger did, than now. <laughs> well, a seven is, you know, still your, your brain is still very, very much in development at, at age seven. Um, so how much of, you know, the, what you've just shared with us is, uh, our memories and, and details that you've pieced together over the years? And, you know, did you understand what was happening on the train when you were seven years old? We saw that map of the allies closing in. Did you understand that the war was coming to an end at the time? Or are these just kind of details and facts that you've managed to piece together with memories in the subsequent years? Well, yeah. Go ahead, I Mary. think first of all, a lot of our memories of course, we're corroborated because uh, we talked about them. Mm -hmm. um, my father wrote his memoirs um, and you know, we talked about them. I mean, I must say when we came to the United States, my parents were so, felt so um, privileged to come to this country and you know, told us never, don't look back. I mean, always remember, but you're in this wonderful country now, make the most of it. Uh, but still, you know, I mean, we remember, we, we discussed uh, these memories. Um, and um, so, you know, of course, I think they actually happen. You're right. I mean, like, it almost seems that for much of these, of being on the lost train, or even being in the camp, but I would think other people felt that way too. Um, you know, it was like you were in another world. Uh, you didn't really have a chance to feel anything. You know, it was just a question of always being afraid of being cold, uh, of being very scared, of being very uncomfortable. And, you know, you're like a little animal. You just are looking for a little comfort. And of course we had the blessing and this is absolutely the most unique part is that we had our parents, which was, extraordinary. Yeah, and it's, you know, the fact that your whole family survives and that you talked about your experience together as a family, I think uh, is based on the survivor talks that we have at the museum regularly. It's uh, rather unusual well, we, we, for the whole family to have survived and to have talked about it as a family. Well, that, that actually most survivors uh, with with Marion has a good memory. I've I have an obsession between the two of us. We can put it all together. Uh, we did not. We, we could not possibly understand the context. Uh, I asked my mother. I mean, I've spent years on this. I asked my mother once, what, what was it like to have us in Berg and Bells? And I I uh, I have four children, and Marion has two, and grandchildren, and all that. I I. I I can imagine being back there, but I wouldn't have, I wouldn't survive it the two days. And I can't imagine that we survived. And my, my, I said, mom, what, this was years and years later, my parents did not talk about uh, the war time till much later and, and partly at our prodding. Uh, but in the first years, uh, the survivors had to rebuild their lives. They had to get a job and learn a language. We had never been to school. Uh, and these were not th things people talked about. Uh, but the, uh, again, I had asked my mother, what was it like? And I, and I thought for my contemporary, I mean, for my, my grown up 
existence, you would say, seeing the children's, my children so starved, seeing them so dirty and filthy, but she, but she didn't say that at all. She said the worst thing was seeing my children so gray. And I, mm -hmm. I said, I mean, th this and was- never, And never smiling. Pardon me? Right. And never she, smiling. Right. I, this is, my, my mother was in her seventies when we had this, 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 this discussion, because I had asked, uh, asked her and I said, mom, what do you mean? And uh, she said, you and Marion were just gray. If, if, you, if you were told to sit someone, somewhere you would sit, you, you, you wouldn't complain, you wouldn't cry, you, you were like a puppet. And again, uh, I having studied this and, and being married to psychiatrists, always a, always a handy choice, uh, I, I understood that because of starvation, mal malnutrition, that, that, that your brain and your body uh, throws whatever energy is left at, the, at, at those organs that require it, the heart, the lungs, and li the liver, but, but the brain functions uh, or reproductive functions in the case of adults uh, deter deteriorate or disappear. And so my, my sister and I, and most people and certainly other children were simply uh, in, in first gear uh, and, and, and not really doing much thinking, uh, just, just surviving. Uh, but the, the the context came later. I mean, cl clearly we did not know. Uh, I mean, we, well, some things we did. The, the the camp was infested with lice, uh, which of course co caused the typhus. And Marion and I would sit in front of the barracks, and and so, at times the weather was okay, and at times it was it was brutal, a brutal winter. But in good times, in good weather, we'd be outside because every everything was covered with lice. We did, we, did, we did not understand what lice meant, but we knew that they itched like hell. So my sister and I would pick lice off each other's head. And I remember the, the clicking sound when, when, when you crushed them between your nails uh, you know, and the itching. So we were, all of us were itching the hole and scratching all the time. But did we realize that lice was a cause of typhus? We did not. That's, yeah, it's a pretty um, incredible answer from, uh, from your mother about, uh, to that question. And it actually leads to a question that we have from the audience. Um, Murray asks, were you ever able to regain some elements of a semi-normal childhood after liberation? Uh, Mary and I had totally different childhoods. Go ahead, Mary, and tell, uh, tell about your childhood. Well, no, I mean, yes, you know, of course. Um, well, when we came to America, you know, my answer would be a resounding yes. Um, although, of course, you know, never actually at this very advanced age, day goes by when I don't think of, of uh, something about that period. Usually it's in connection of, of kind of gratefulness um, and appreciation and humility. I mean, I look, you know, I feel in a way, why was I miraculously lucky enough uh, to survive this? And I will never know the answer. It was a miracle. And how do you describe a miracle? Um, so, um, yes, you know, we came to America. Um, we, we, we started school late, but we got a good education. Um, so I am very grateful. Um, I'm grateful that we ended up in this wonderful country. It's certainly not perfect as we see these days. Um, and of course, when you go through an experience like that, um, you're always more appreciative. Uh, you never see the world quite the same way um, as people who have not had a beginning like ours. And uh, my experience was, was different because uh, as a boy uh, coming to America, first we had, we had to learn English. We, we had our own language in Bergen-Belsen. We thought that we, we thought we invented it, but all the children, it was, it was sort of a pig Latin. But we came to America, we had to go to uh, learn English. And for a boy, uh, I, I, I didn't have a role model. My, my father was, really busy just trying to to just get a job and 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 support a family in a strange country 
and he was a traveling salesman. He was absent uh, during the week. He came home from weekends, uh, and and he was very quiet. He would he you know quite frankly, uh, I, years later in, in my later life when life uh, presents one with 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 whatever hits and slams life gives all of us, I, I realized he he was a bit of a a, a broken man. He, he had he. He had fought valiantly uh, and successfully to keep uh, four people al alive, and uh, but you know, but it, it 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 took a lot out of him. So no, there, there was ne never anybody to throw a ball a ball for me. So I never played sports. To to me, a, a quarterback is a tax refund. I've never seen a football game. I never will. My sister was popular. She was Miss Forest Hills. She was a uh, at uh, at a high school and. Um, I was a, sort of a sad sack, uh, but we we are in in uh, agree that that with all the problems that we have in this country, this is by far the best country uh, in the world. I I'm quite conservative. I I served in the military for four years. My father s sort of insisted that it, that it was payback t time. Uh, I was a navy officer, uh, but it was the best time of my life. Uh, uh, we fly the. Fl uh, my parents and uh, and I uh, flew the flag every day. I have a big 20, 20 foot flagpole outside, so I'm, I'm I consider myself a super patriot. Uh, but it, it was tough for me as a teenager. I was not popular. Uh, I was a, 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 I was a, a loner. Uh, Marion had a much more positive attitude to his life and times. But we but we agree on the country. Well, uh, Stephen, thank you for your service to this country. Um, and we do actually have some questions from our audience about how you came to be in the United States. Um, several people ask, uh, how long were you in Holland before you came to the United States? How old were you when you settled in the United States? No, you can go ahead. Um, well, of course, when you know the war was over, we ended up back in Amsterdam. But as my brother mentioned, there was never a place I think my parents wanted to stay, remain. Um, they didn't want to stay in Europe. They wanted to get far away from Europe. And of course, it was everyone's dream to come to the United States. Uh, and uh, that was not always easy. Luckily, we did have quite a few relatives who had come and they, you know, they were, gave us the visa. You couldn't come to the United States unless someone vouched that you would never be on welfare. And so we ended up coming to the United States. It took a while. I had some health problems and that kept up the, delayed the process. Uh, but we came here and we were nine years old. We had never gone to school. Um, we arrived in New York because um, my father's relatives had come to New York, um, and then um, the rest was the rest was history. We we did try to start a life in America. Um, the first year it was difficult because instead of being in school, we became almost like the poster child of the Holocaust. You know, twins surviving the Holocaust. So. We were invited to have lunch with Mrs. Eleanor Roosevelt, um, you know, the mayor of Chinatown, the mayor of New York, uh, something at the United Nations. Um, so I remember we were always pulled out of out of school, um, you know, to a degree we, we kind of didn't even know what the fuss was about because, you know, that was our life. Um, but you know, then we, we, my father, my parents bought a very small house in Queens and we ended up living there for many, many years. Thank you. Um, so someone has a question. We have a question from uh, Aniko about uh, keeping food at the, at the end of your bed. Um, Aniko asks if there are any other behaviors and habits like that that you carried with you into your life mm. that uh, you can sort of trace back to um, well, I, your experience. I, 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 have, I, I have my share. Uh, I, I can't stand to throw bread away uh, unless it's, it's really green. I mean, bread goes bad. 
uh, and uh, bread was the currency in the concentration camp. And if you could get a, sl a slice of bread, maybe Marion has time to tell a quick story about her birthday there. But uh, uh, I have a, a really annoying food disorder where I, on, I, on, I eat the same thing every week. Uh, I, 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 if I see normal meat like a steak or or stuff like that, it just it's, it sickens me. Uh, but I can eat a, I can eat a hot dog or a hamburger because it doesn't look like meat. Uh, I'm also very self protective. Uh, I, I don't like to travel. Marion Marion is a world traveler. Uh, I much rather be home. Uh, so uh, but, uh, there are plenty of idiosyncrasies. I don't think Marion has them. I've never I've never seen them. But uh, I have my share. <laughs> well, Marianne, of course, you, you want um, you want yeah, to quickly tell about her birthday? Yes, yes. Um, talking about gifts for gifts for our sixth birthday, we were still in the camp. My father sold his wedding ring, and we got two pieces of bread with some butter and um, hachelslaf. Seventh birthday is uh, seventh birthday. Is, is kind of the favorite breakfast food for children, at least it was. Now dentists would disapprove of it because it's chocolate, chocolate sprinkles. And so, um, you know, chocolate sprinkles and two slices of bread. And my brother and I split the sandwich, of course. And I think we must have eaten it over many weeks or many, many days, just several crumbs a day because that was the most extraordinary birthday present uh, that we ever got. So, um, you know, also, I do remember that when I first came to this country, uh, for years and years, I, you know, I kind of had insomnia because I thought if I ever fell, to sleep, fell asleep, I would never wake up again. Um, and, and also, of course, my love of flowers. Um, um, you know, to me, flowers are such living things um, that when I come you know, if I don't water my flowers, I feel like um, I, I, I have done something really kind of negligent. So it's, you know, it's things like that, um, that remain with you. And of course, you know, a certain humility, it's, um, I mean, I have a very privileged life, a very blessed life, uh, but I'm aware of it. I'm aware of, um, you know, what that came from and all the people who were as worthy as I was to be talking to you today and they are not here, but I am. Thank you both uh, so much uh, for answering these questions for our audience. To our audience, I think that's, that's all the questions that we have time for, but um, I just want to Thank on behalf of Holocaust Museum LA. Uh, thank Marion and Stephen for being with us here today to share your story um, and the incredible um, just determination and resourcefulness of your parents uh, is, is something really remarkable. Um, and before we finish, I'll just ask you both one last question, which is what do you hope that our viewers today will take away from your story. I'll, I'll let Marion answer that. Well, you know, you, you, you do have to pray for a better world. Um, the Holocaust was unique um, and that should of course never ever happen again. Um, but, you know, also the people in Afghanistan um, who were our allies, our friends, and who now may not be able to, uh, to get out. It's to be aware and be kind um, and, you know, before humanity and against evil, against discrimination. I think that is a wonderful note to, to end on. Um, Thank you, Marion and Stephen, for being with us today. Uh, before we sign off, I want to invite everyone uh, to join us on Friday at 11 a.m. for our uh, 
weekly Holocaust survivor talk, uh, which will feature survivor Michelle Rodri, who will share her story of survival in Nazi occupied France. Uh, and you can join us again next week on Tuesday, August 31st at 10 a.m. for an international collaboration program. Uh, Frida Reisman, who is a survivor of the Minsk ghetto, will join us virtually from Minsk and share her story as well as discuss her ongoing efforts uh, to preserve and teach the history of the Minsk ghetto. You can find more information about our virtual events on our website at holocaustmuseumla.org. And a recording of this program will be available on Holocaust Museum LA's YouTube channel tomorrow. Holocaust Museum LA brings you programs like today's at no charge. If you are enjoying our programs, please consider supporting our work by becoming a member. To learn more about our membership levels and benefits, you can visit holocaustmuseumla.org slash membership. Thank you one more time to Mary and I'm Lewin and Stephen Hess for joining us today. And thank you to all of you for watching. Uh, and we hope to have you all join us again sometime soon. Thank you, Almany. Thank you. And thank, thank you 155 unseen listeners. Thank you for your time. <laughs>